Hey everyone, it's Robin, R. Silent Crafts, and welcome to my studio. Today we are going to make our own dish drying mats. These two I made using a pre-purchased dish drying mat, but I'm also going to give you some tips and tricks and ideas on how to make your own with probably whatever you have on hand at home right now. We have several options that we can use and a lot of creativity for making our dish drying mat. I purchased this dish drying mat several years ago. I believe it was a Dollar Tree purchase, otherwise it could have been a Walmart. But I know the Dollar Tree does have dish drying mats that you can purchase. My local store just doesn't have any at the moment. So I've been using this for years. It works perfectly fine. It doesn't soak all the way through. It protects my counter somewhat. It's not something that I would leave just laying out wet anyways. I do not have a dishwasher, but I have a dish strainer that I keep to the side that drains into the sink. And then I have this one over here for just some of the overflow things. I like to put my sharp knives and stuff like that on it. Now, just by feeling this, I can tell that there is a foam center. For my project today, I'm going to show you two different versions on how to use a pre-made dish drying mat. But I want to give you some ideas of other things you can use. There is a company I'll see if I can find them and put a link down below, but it's Bosal, B-O-S-A-L, and they have a foam that is specifically made for dish drying mats. I don't know if it has any other pur purposes. I haven't gotten that far into the research, but they specifically make them and it keeps popping up online and in videos that you can use that. In the past, they've had kits that you can purchase where it's already cut to the shape and it already has the curves and everything. For me, the curves make it look nice, but it's not absolutely necessary. So if you have that or you have your old one, you can just go ahead and repurpose it. Now the whole goal is to absorb water and to keep it from sitting wet on our counter for a long time. So you can take a hand towel or I just have a small towel here and you can use that because a lot of people just lay a hand towel or some type of dish towel on the counter and they just set their dishes on that and it works perfectly fine. So if you want to jazz that up, you can use your towel and just add some fabric to it in a similar way that I'm going to show you for my dish drying mats. You could also use some cotton batting. My cotton batting isn't very thick, so I would feel like I would want to have at least two layers of the cotton batting just to have something for that water to absorb into. Most times when you're doing the dishes, you're not going to take a cup of water really sop and wet and just go from one sink and just plop it on there so that the dish drying mat's all wet. You're going to let it drain for a second or two and then put it on there. So you're not going to be pouring puddles of water onto this but you might want it to absorb just a little bit more. So I think doubling up the cotton batting would work pretty good. Now I don't have any wool batting and I'm not familiar with wool batting, but I feel like wool batting would be a good option also. I know flannel is a good option. They make those unpaper towels and they make cloth napkins and such and they use flannel. So you would be able to make one with flannel. Maybe if you wanna combine the flannel on the back or even both places and then have your batting single or double and put your fun cotton fabric on top. That would give you a nice option. I think many of us have things around our home that we can use or we have been using as a dish drying mat anyways. So let's go ahead and take a look and see how I've been converting my dish drying mat into a fun version. I feel like this is optional for many of your options, but I wanna put a backing on mine. So I just have a basic piece of cotton fabric. I'm not gonna be able to give you any actual measurements. I'll tell you what I'm using for mine, but all dish drying mats, depending on where you get them and if you make your own, it's gonna be different. And I think a really good idea is to look at that space that you're going to be using. Some people have smaller apartments and some people have more space that they're gonna use. Maybe you have a skinny spot, but you need it to be pretty long. Now my dish drying mat fits really well. Here is my dish strainer, and then I just have a couple inches of counter left before it's at the end. And it fits nicely this way. I think they made them purposely to fit in that area. But again, if you need to make yours larger or smaller, I did see for the Bozal foam that they had in the past, had some that were half the size. So if you were in a camper, or some type of motorhome or something that you could have a smaller version. 
Now, mine has a hanger on it so that you can, I imagine, hang up your mat after you use it to let it air dry. Because if you just let a wet one sit on your counter all the time, it could start to get that little black speckles of mold on the bottom or mildew. Plus, sometimes they just don't smell nice. Whatever we're going to put on our new dish drying mat, we want to make sure that it can go through the washer at least. With it being the foam like this, I usually don't put mine in the dryer because I find that it just kind of gets stuck in weird spots in my dryer. So I do let it air dry, but I just take mine and I prop it up and let it dry like that. So today I'm going to be removing the hanger, but if you'd like to, you can go ahead and keep yours. Now to put on top, we have a variety of things we could put up here. We could put some of our old quilt blocks and build that out to fit our little mat here. We could just use some scraps. One piece of fun fabric to use in the kitchen might be nice. It's really fun to either use it as a holiday version. You could put a holiday fabric on the back and then an everyday use on the front so you can flip it over for maybe Christmas or Halloween we can match it with our kitchen that's one of the fun things it's hard to buy a piece of something for our kitchen and match it nicely if we've personalized our kitchen so for this one i thought i'd have something fun for my kitchen and i made this So out of my pizza fabric and my orange fabric, I just cut five inch charm squares. As you can see, there's a little bit of a black border on it because my drying mat measures 18 inches by 15 and a half because it's a rectangle and not a square. And it, I, I sat down and I tried a whole bunch of variety of different things of math and there was no way I was going to get it even. So you may have to make your top larger and then just trim it down to size after you have it all sewn together. By using 5 inch squares or charm squares, it gave me that nice contrast with the orange and the black. Pizza is one of my favorite foods and I cook it often. So this is what mine looked like before. I put the little black strips on. I'm gonna put black binding on mine, so I thought it would be fine to just go ahead and add that. Now I was thinking you have a few options. I had left my binding right on here. I'm not even gonna worry about taking it off, but there's really big stitches on here. You could take the binding off and see if you could reuse it. You can purchase the prepackaged bias strips and use that for your binding, or you can just create your own. I cut two and a half inch strips enough to go all the way around with a little bit extra that I'm gonna use for my binding. Now my mats do have a little bit of curve and I haven't fully tested out this project yet, but I just cut mine regular straight grain with a fabric. Since it has curves, you could cut it as a bias fabric, but I wanted to see first if it's a gradual enough curve, if it's not too bad that I can go around it. And for me, if my test versions here get a little bit of a pucker on the binding, then I'll know in the future if I wanna make more to go ahead and make sure I use the bias binding. And I thought I'd go ahead and test it out for you guys so you would know too whether or not you need to purchase your bias binding or make your own bias binding, or if we can just get away and cheat a little bit and use the straighter grain. What I decided is I'm just gonna use the plain old white glue and I am going to spread it all over here generously and adhere my backing and iron it down really well. I was thinking it'd be a little bit hard to pin through all of this foam. If you're just using quilt batting or if you're using the towel, you might be able to pin through it maybe with some safety pins. But I thought this would probably be more of an issue with the foam in there and it being a little thick and I didn't want anything to bunch up. So you may notice my rings on here and this is, even though it's been washed and dried, I put my, my lid from my Dutch oven on here after I washed it and it's just over time, it just tends to make some creases in it. As I start using it again, it works its way out. I also keep this folded in my linen closet so that's why I have that crease there. I'm not going to worry about it, I'm also going to cover it with fabric now so it's going to be like new. Now this is just a Dollar Tree school glue. Any white school glue will work. You could even try a glue stick if that's what you happen to have at home. I find that this does really well to temporarily hold my fabric down and it comes out in the wash. You could always put binder clips along the edge or something like that, but I just don't wanna have to worry about anything moving. 
as I go to quilt it together and finish off my project. Just lay my fabric down, smooth it all out. You could spread your glue a little bit if you want, but I found that this just works fine. I'm going to take this over to my iron and I'm going to, even with the steam on, I'll go ahead and press it until my glue dries. And it's only going to be temporary. I can easily just pull this up even after the glue dries. It's just going to be in place of pins or clips for me. There are products you can find to adhere this also. I have Light Steam Seam 2. Mine is a quarter inch roll that I use for putting in zippers and such, but you can also put that down to hold it on. If you have some scraps of other two-sided fusible, you can put that down. I find school glue is very inexpensive, easy to find, and I always have a bottle around the house. I'm going to be quilting this, so I'm not going to take off any of the extra around here, but I do want to remove my little hanger. If you want, you can save it and add it to your finished product if you still want to hang it. And then I'll just remove some excess up here. So for this option, the patchwork option, I'll just lay this on here. You can use some pins to hold it into place. You can also put some of that glue down here. Stitching through this foam, I'll show you on the next project of an example of what it looks like, but you're not going to be able to put your stitching really close together. You just want to put enough stitching in there, enough quilting, just to hold it all together and in place. So for this, I might just stitch a quarter inch from each of them and just stitch that way. Let me show you another option that I've been working on. I wanted to play with jelly roll strips and do a quilt as you go to see how that would work. Again, I have some black for my binding to go all the way around. And I already started this, but I wanted to go ahead and do a little bit of the quilting with you so you can see what it's like. I laid my first jelly roll strip face up. And then I laid my second one right sides together, just like if we're working on some type of a string block and we're working in the center and working our way out. It's the same theory. You could start on the edge if you wanted to and just work your way across, but I like working from the center and working out. So now I already have the same backing on here and it has been glued down, just held in place just enough so that I can keep quilting it. And then I have my drying mat. I'm going to take this over to my sewing machine and I'm going to use a quarter inch seam. Now while sewing this, because I was going through so many layers and the foam, I decided to increase my stitch length. Normally I would stitch my patchwork with a 2.0 stitch length. This time I bumped it up to a 3.5. The more layers or the thicker the fabric that you're going to, the longer you need your stitch length to be. I thought of this very similar to a quilt as you go pot holder. The only difference is I don't need this to be heat resistant, I need it to absorb water. Once it's finished, it's going to be able to go through the washer and dryer. That's very important. So let me put the camera over towards the sewing machine and show you what it looks like when I'm stitching through this. Now, because of the thickness of this foam presser mat, I did need to lift my presser foot up all the way manually just so that I could get everything in. I'm going to start just off the edge of the mat using my quarter inch seam allowance and remember I'm bumping it up to a three and a half for my stitch length. You could try to pin your fabric down if you want but I'm just going to adjust it as I go. We don't have to go super fast. It might just take a little bit to get it going. It's just really weird to stitch through because it's so squishy and I can see how much my presser foot is squishing it down. But I'm just sewing on a basic Brother sewing machine. I do have a CS6000i, it is a computerized one, but I feel like if you just have a regular machine that only does a straight stitch or a straight stitch and zigzag that you will still be able to do this. I'm just letting the feed dogs pull it through. I'm not pressing on anything or forcing it through. It's just kind of curving through here all on its own adjusting it as I go. You can slow down the speed by your foot pedal or if you have an adjuster on the machine. You can 
can try a walking foot if you'd like to see if that works good for you. There you can see my stitches. They do make a bit of a channel there. So I just take this over to my ironing station. I just press it over. You could just hand press it like this because it's really not much to do because it's really sucked down into the foam. And when you look at it on the back, you can see it like that. This reminds me of like a chair cushion or something and how the fabric ones, they get stitched down like that. So if you want, you can give it a little bit of a press over. But for me, this material, whatever this is, it just holds it nicely. And then you choose your next strip and you put it right sides together. Then I'll just take that back over and I will stitch it and I will keep going until I'm past the end. And I want to make sure that both my back and my front go a little bit past. So that way when I'm finished, there'll be enough fabric that covers it. So for my pizza drying mat, it's no different. I'm just going to do a different version of stitching down. And since I put the glue on to hold it, I can manipulate it and move it around and not worry as much. You could try just putting some pins in through your top layer and your foam or your towel or whatever you happen to be using. And then stitch all the way off just to secure everything. I'll just continue doing that same quilting on all of the seams on all of the little charm squares. So now that I've done all of my quilting and my two drying mats are finished for the most part, I just have to do the binding. So what I did is I did a stitch all the way around just to hold all the layers together. So when I go to put the binding on, it's going to be much easier. It also gave me a spot that I could easily trim all of the excess off. Did the same thing on this one. So I tried to either stitch through the binding or right in that little ditch that goes all the way along. And when I go to put my binding on, that's going to cover it. Now, if all of this seems like too much for you, what you can do is just have your two pieces of fabric and whatever you're going to put on the inside. For example, if we're going to use a towel and two pieces of fabric, what I want to do is I want to put my inside piece, whether it's my foam or my towel or my batting, I'll lay that down first. And I'll take one piece of my fabric and lay it right side up. Now remember, this is just a little sample. This is not the way it would actually look. I would take my second piece of fabric and I want to put it right sides down so that the right sides are together. So the inside two pieces of fabric right sides together. About three eighths of an inch in from the edge, back stitch, stitch all the way around until you come back to here and give yourself, based on the size of the project, you could do a three to five inch opening. So back stitch there. And then we're just gonna do that, that stitch and flip type thing, right sides together. Put your arm inside, pull it all the way out. We've done it before on coasters. We did it on the makeup pads. We've done it on mug rugs and quilts. It's a really common process. So once you've done that and you've flipped it right side out, you'll have your fabric on the bottom, you'll have your inside, and your fabric on the top. And you'll have that opening down here. So you just tuck that little bit inside and you'll do a stitch it's a little bit thick, so maybe you might want to do it about a quarter of an inch or down to an eighth of an inch all the way around the edges, and that will seal this up. You can leave that as is and call it done, or if you'd like, you can go ahead and add just a couple rows of quilting stitching all the way through. I'm going to go ahead and add the binding to mine, and I'll show you what it looks like when it's done. And there they are all finished. I do have a couple of thoughts on this. Now for me, these corners are going to be fine. These are older ones. They're going to serve their time and I'm going to use them as is, no problem. If I were to make these as a gift or to put into my Etsy shop, I would definitely go for the bias binding. You can see it, it's hard to tell on the black, but it does get scrunched up a little bit. It's not super bad and it looks fine. 
The other thing I would do is if I were to use these mats again, the one that I started with, I would remove the binding. The binding is causing an extra thickness underneath here, the binding that came with the original mat, and it's causing it to kind of cup up a little bit there. Again, it's not going to be a problem. It's going to work perfectly fine in my kitchen. But if I wanted to make these for other people and to make them as gifts or in the Etsy shop or whatever, then I would definitely want to change it up a little bit. I'm going to keep my eye out for the Dollar Tree dish mats so that I can find those. But I think overall that this is a really fun project. I think it's going to add a lot of color to my kitchen. And then I'm going to smile every time I see it. So your scrappy word for this video will be dish drying mat. And I know that's a big phrase, but basically I just like to know, do you use a dish drying mat? I know most houses have dishwashers. My house doesn't have a dishwasher. It was built in 1986. And with my little kitchen, there never really was a place, there wasn't room to put a dishwasher in. So we've just been hand washing the dishes all these years. And it's not that big of a deal. Let me know down below in the comments if you're going to try to make your own dish drying mat. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!